Oh, I thought it was the sky. <sighs> Long week, man. Really. I'm not even joking. I know we all work and put in our time or whatever, but ah, freedom. When will it happen? I guess when we decide, huh? Um, I'm not necessarily going to call this a survival drop because I'm not going to say this is given the information necessary for survival. But I will say it gives perspectives on some possible realities, you know, some things that maybe you need to think about. Not you, but you, somebody you know, you know what I'm saying? We all live amongst others. So, I'll play a little video. Probably have a little backdraft after it. <laughs> Live amongst these courts and justice. Who will protect us? <laughs> Turn this thing around, man. Hope everybody doing all right. You know what I'm saying? It is exhausting out there. <laughs> Spiritually speaking. Everybody. You're listening to Obsidian Radio, the voice of the everyday brother. And I wanted to do a little something with regard to survivalism today. I was supposed to do it last week. Didn't have a chance to do that because I was ripping and running and taking care of other business. So, and I was going to do it over the weekend and got into some other things. So, we're going to double up on survivalism this week, my friends. Today, and I, I've done a lot of research, put down a lot of information that I want to get to and we're going to discuss. But before we do any of that, I think it's really good for us to take a minute out here and discuss a few uh, broader principles and hard truths. Okay? And I want to say this in conjunction to all the good emails and letters that I've gotten from preppers all of them white, I might add. Many of them current or ex-military. King Drop just said that. While we don't got no black survivalists, it's natural and as much soul as we claim. Don't none of us know what to do in the woods. They got the drop on us, man. No doubt. Sending me all kinds of great information, tips, advice. I'm so thankful. Shout yourself out in the comments. There's too many of you to mention. Um... I'm sorry, I hate to cut in. Personal confession. But my old lady no more survival stuff than me or whatever. Yes, yeah, she Caucasian or whatever you want to call that. Well, not Caucasian. Ain't no Caucasian in her DNA or whatever. We, You know what I'm saying? Blood tests and shit. But, sorry, I got something in my hands. Literally, like, the simplest things. I hate to even say it when it comes to automotives. My people so unprepared. I gotta ask her people for shit, you know? Like, as far as the know-how, the know you know? And that, just enough said, you get what I'm saying. We need to do better. <laughs> I'm really deeply appreciative and thankful for that. <clears throat> um, one prepper in particular, current U.S. Army, and he made the point that, uh, I'm not gonna use his name, he made the point that, um, you know, it's important for you to get with your team and discuss certain things ahead of time and etc and so forth and it's all really great advice can't argue with any of it but I do have one thing to say this series that I'm doing on survivalism 101 for the everyday brother is specifically tailored to the everyday average brother who makes less than 30 grand a year or they're about 30 grand is some change whatever doesn't my point is you don't have a lot of money and to be frank you don't have a lot of friends the sad truth is that a lot of black people aren't really close knit there are some we all know with notable exceptions but the simple truth of the matter is that a lot of black folk aren't close knit like that anymore they don't have a solid cohesive family unit with which to rely on each other, to plan together, etc. 
That puts black people at a decided disadvantage when the shit hits the fan. And that's important because we're talking about this at a time when not only Greece has collapsed, I've heard that the European Union has hammered out an agreement to basically bail Greece out. We'll see how that goes. But in addition to that, we've also gotten reports that China is experiencing an economic meltdown, not unlike what happened here in the United States with the stock market crash of 1929 that presaged the Great Depression. But in addition, Venezuela. that the de facto state of Puerto Rico has also now experienced an economic meltdown. As well as Venezuela. My understanding is that they are at least twice as much in debt, if not as much as four times as much in debt. I pray I remember, but I'm going to show you a video of how bad Venezuela is right now. Venezuela got some problems. And we going to have some problems. As the Motor City, when it declared bankruptcy three years ago. Let me repeat that. Puerto Rico, the de facto state of the United States, is in worse economic condition than Detroit was three years ago when it declared bankruptcy. Aye, aye, aye. As a matter of fact, my understanding is that the rats are leaving the ship over there. That is to say, those Puerto Rican citizens, American citizens they are, who are able to leave the island are doing so, pretty much leaving those who can't behind. Shades of Hurricane Katrina. For real. Don't play about that. Wasn't funny. Very so, odd. my survivalism series is... I'm sorry. Um, it was either King Drop or Lex Will. I've been back... I've been catching up on my videos, y'all. So I know y'all been dropping. I only been able to catch a few of them. So I'm, I'm catching up now. But it was either King Drop this morning or Lex Will. Forgive me because I don't remember which one which said this. But it was King Drop. About the... I'm sorry. I'm mentally stuttering because I wasn't prepared to even talk about this. Um, a nuclear missile going under the San Francisco Bridge or some prediction of that extent they were dealing with the the number of nine and synchronicity and stuff you know it's kind of spirit science kind of new age but at the same time all the hijack I like that term yeah I'm sorry using that hijack but um all you know shoot I think it is it's what is it it's August now Katrina hit August 28th or 29th, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, we, we like right on the tip of hurricane season out here. They just got to hit us with one good one. And we in virtual chaos from here pretty much to Texas. And I'm saying from here, I'm from Slidell, Louisiana. There's literally a lake in between me and New Orleans. So, yeah, I'm screwed. <laughs> I need to get the holy hell out of here. <laughs> Based on... The everyday brother who doesn't have a lot of means, but does have something going for him upstairs, if you know what I mean. And one of the things that the everyday brother will have to look at honestly is that he is on his own. Or are we? There ain't going to be any Calvary. Drop. You're not going to be able to rely on family and friends. And let's be brutally frank. In a lot more instances than we're willing to admit, your family is going to be more of a liability to you than an asset, if anything. <clears throat> Sad to say, mm -hmm. I don't like saying that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't change the truth. Mm -hmm. So while I'm deeply appreciative of all the great advice and tips in this regard that I've gotten from so many preppers, the simple truth of the matter is, is that for most brothers in this situation, it's not going to be applicable. 
they're going to be, for the most part, solo operators. Which is going to emphasize even more the importance and necessity of self-reliance, of preparation, of planning, of contingency planning, the rule of three, have plan A, plan B, plan C, really having your plans down pat, really having your preparation on point, having backups to your backups, you get the idea. Now, let's move to the second very nasty, bitter truth. When the shit hits the fan, a lot of black people are going to die. Let me repeat that. When the shit hits the fan, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of black people are going to to die. We've already seen this with the Hurricane Katrina fiasco and disaster 10 years ago. YouTube survivalist prepper, the Patriot Nurse, she, did, she does excellent videos by the way. I'm going to put her channel in the description box along with a link to the video I'm specifically referencing, she talks about the death waves after the shit hits the fan. Waves of dead people, ladies and gentlemen. And she talks about those who are most vulnerable to wind up dead. And they are as follows. The elderly, young children, and when I say young children, you know, 10 years old and younger. The elderly, of course, I mentioned them. The senile, <clears throat> the disabled, and those most dependent upon the government. Now, she didn't say, the, say this the way I'm going to say it. But what she meant was, we all know what that means. What she meant is the black folks. The EBT crowd. I'm not kicking dirt on anybody who's receiving government assistance. I'm just making the point that those most reliant on government assistance are going to be those most vulnerable when the shit hits the fan. Why? Because they rely on the government to do everything for them. And they don't rely on themselves to do anything for themselves. I'm not saying I advocate. I advocate. What the hell is that? I'm not saying I advocate everything he's saying. Um, of course, of, of course, a lot of the whole solo you against the world junk. There's no brotherhood in that. I understand the line that he's, you know, drawing. But at the same time, as far as if you watching my page, you know what we trying to build, or what we would like and hope to build, become a community again, become a true people, and I mean a true people. You know, not this carbon copy lifestyle that we've been living for yet so long. But <clears throat> I'll admit from my area, because it's all I can speak on. These brothers love them some FEMA. And I'm saying brothers because it's mostly the women or whatever, and no disrespect or whatever. But, you know, um, you know, the sisters straight up, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, there could be a power outage. There could be a, a power outage, literally. For one afternoon, a whole day's power outage or anything in between. Um, and they'll be up FEMA ass getting food stamp credits like $300 and $500 and this, that, and the other. All you got to do is walk up to FEMA and say you had a deep freezer. And when the power went off, you lost food. And they be working the hustle. Like with no joke, I'm like, you know, moms be calling me like, hey, your sister went up there. You know, all you got to go up in here is just say yada, 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 give them the address, whoop de whoop tell them you lost this, and they're going to hand you that money, you know. But at the same time, I'm like, what are y'all signing? You know what I'm saying? What information on your life are you giving them to get them them stamps or that credit or whatever you want to call it? You know, I hate to go to the damn doctor because I got to tell them if I didn't move to this, that, and the other. What's your current address, sir? Mind your damn business. That's where the fuck I live. Um... 
You get what I'm saying? So I don't advocate everything he's saying because a lot of it is cold. You know what I'm saying? And this is a harsh reality type video. But you feel me. You know what I'm saying? That is a downfall that I have seen. And I, me and my brother was talking or whatever. You know what I'm saying? We just already imagined the second anything happened. More hands going to go out than hands going up in revolution. You know? <laughs> Like, you know, open, ah, shite. Glad nothing was open, I almost dropped some stuff. But, you know, open palms to receive instead of ball fist or, you know, revolution. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be a whole bunch of, you know, Oliver. <laughs> Please, sir, can I have some more? Again, Hurricane Katrina is your proof. You don't quit saying that shit. Who were the most casualties coming out of that scenario, ladies and gentlemen? Were they white or were they black? Who were the most dependent upon welfare and other forms of government assistance in that situation? Were they white or were they black? Who were the most disabled? Who were the most senile? Etc. Personal story, partially heartbreaking if you are in any type of situation like this because, you know, stuff happens. Um, during Katrina, my mother's mother had had her, okay, um, on July 4th of the year that Katrina hit, she had her fifth stroke, and she had recovered and back, bounced back from so many strokes or whatever that this one actually caused a heart attack at the same time, and, you know, without the technical terminology or whatever, the compact of stroke and heart attack short-circuited a bunch of nerves in the brain you know say it like that and what we ended up with you know with all due respect to my my grandmother you know is a vegetable you know all she could do is breathe on her own but you know the rest was feeding tubes and you know we had the whole hospice situation but when Katrina hit we had to set it up in a hospital for a hospital to take her you know and that's just not a good feeling, you know, especially if it's the, you know, they're saying shit hits the fan. Some people say zombie apocalypse. Some people say D-Day. Um, you, you can find the information in all kind of ways. You know, if you're looking for your backpack type stuff, you know, 72 hour bags, bug out bags, and you'll get all kind of drop on that stuff. But in these types of scenarios, situations, whatever, if, if the... The theme is shit hitting the fan. Therefore, you're taking, you know, you're taking off. You know, uh, civilization as you know it does not exist in the same context. You leaving that family member for good. Well, Katrina, we knew we were coming back, or at least hopes. It took about three months for us to get back home or whatever, but at the same time, we knew that we'd get back home. Or at least the plan was to get back home to the family. In that type of situation, you know, medication issues, disabilities, this, that, and the other, those will be some heartbreaking decisions, you know. And I'm all for teamwork. If you carry somebody on your back, do so. But it's a reality. Just a reality. One of the reasons why I talk so much with regard to obesity is for this right now. The Patriot Nurse talks about it, too. Again, links are going to be in the description box below. If you're not able to make a five-mile trek on foot, you're not going to make it when the shit hits the fan. Straight up and down. Because you're not going to be able to rely on cars or public transportation, and you're not going to be able to rely on a bicycle. You might be able to do it, but more than likely you won't. More than likely you're going to be able, going to have to be able to make the trek on foot. And by on foot, I mean actively on foot. Climbing over stuff, under stuff, around stuff. Walking up a lot of hills. Rocky terrain. You name it. A lot of black people. And, and that's just the, the, the terrain factor. We're not talking about the weather factor. Extreme weather conditions and whatnot. A lot of black people will not make it. Ladies and gentlemen. If you are morbidly obese, you're basically dead. 
If you're disabled, and by disabled I mean you're confined to a scooter chair or a wheelchair of some sort, your mobility is greatly limited, you're basically dead. If you're walking with a cane and you got a good bit of mobility, you got a fighting chance. And you're not morbidly obese. You got a fighting chance. Yours truly, I walk with a cane, but I'm not obese at all. And a lot of people tell me that I move really fast for a guy with a cane. So I have a chance of making it. As a matter of fact, I'm going to see to it that I make it. Damn right. Because I practice, I practice simple parkour techniques with my cane. Shaft. Look, look up parkour. That's going to be a hugely important skill to have when the shit hits the fan. I'm Sad to say, and I'm not even... All right, for what I'm going to say, it sounds like a bunch of repeating, but I didn't watch this video before I showed y'all. I already know this category of conversation. There's only so much a educated person can say in this category of conversation. Like the downsides, the pros, and the cons. When you get to the cons, there's pretty much only so much you can say. You can say a lot, but the basic statistics seem to be the same. But... <clears throat> Parkour. I live in the country. I may not have to deal with this. <laughs> you know, but any of y'all city dwellers, say to say, y'all might need to be, y'all might need to know how to stick and move. Now, so far from his conversation, it seems like he's playing on quote unquote bugging in. Not bugging out, but bugging in. Which means he's gonna stand for his, you know, he's gonna stand his ground where he is. And, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But I, for one, am not advocating staying within any cities. And that reminds me I have to show y'all the Venezuela video. So, let's hurry up with this. I'm not saying you got to do Captain America, you know, Liam Neeson and taking Jeremy Renner and the Bourne Legacy type parkour type shit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just simple being able to get over and under and around obstacles. In the everyday environment. If you can do that, your chances of making it when the shit hits the fan is that much increased. Get yourself into shape. Lose the weight. The vast majority of black folks won't do it, which is the reason why the vast majority of them will be dead. Leave that pork alone. When the shit hits the fan. I lost 10 pounds, left that pork alone, man. A lot of black folks are not preppers. You're right. Here on YouTube, you can literally find a handful of black preppers. Literally a handful, if that. I was about to talking say less. about these things. This, despite Hurricane Katrina, despite September 11th, despite the Ebola outbreak, despite Baltimore riots and other riots taking place in the country, despite the economic meltdowns of Detroit and now Puerto Rico, despite the fact that there have been EBT card stoppages, despite all of these things, black folks still are not preppers. This shows you the extent to which black folks are so wholly reliant on the government. And remember back in Katrina with what happened in the Superdome? It was See, the not worst thing good. that can, you can be and that can happen to you is being a refugee. Because now you are at the sole whim of the government. You know, I could stop. No, I'm going to let him finish the statement. I'm sorry. Like I said, look at what happened in the Superdome. Look at what happened at the convention center down in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. A lot of rape. A lot of rape. That's where those black folks fail to plan will wind up if they're lucky at the worst case scenario they'll just be outright dead oh and this is all going to go down in the first 72 hours this goes back to the death waves that that the, the patriot nurse was talking about first wave is going to hit in the first 72 hours first wave of death so in my mind that's victims of panic <laughs> you know People being trampled, car crashes. Um, you know, there's gonna be tribal. There's gonna be gangs. There's gonna be street gangs. You know, like you know, Jim Bob and his homeboys. They gonna team up. I was at boxing class yesterday or whatever, and um, you know, I I wasn't trying to eavesdrop on nobody, but I just happened to walk up, and 
the, for some reason the converse, the dialogue of the conversation that was being had that I walked into was um I don't know the dialogue of the conversation I walked into because as soon as I walked up, coach turned to me and he was like, Oh, how many black people are in Slidell? And my answer was, I don't know. From my knowledge, we were no more than 2% of all the high schools in town, my high school included. He tells me, there are 6,000 black people in Slidell, or Negroes, whatever, you, you know. I knew the ball, I mentally knew the ballpark of the population of Slidell, so just knowing the 6,000, okay, that's our space, there's 30,000 Caucasians and other. I'm not racist, <laughs> but I got to get the holy hell out of here. <laughs> Man, if that is not outnumbered, you know what I'm saying, and you know, I feel better if within that 6,000. I had more homeboys, you know, like me, you know, somebody I could talk, you know, consciously with, you know, um, strategically and logically with. You know, I know a lot of brothers who play checkers but don't understand chess, if you know what I'm saying. Um, yeah, I got to roll. <laughs> Straight up. Because Jim Bob and his homeboys are going to team up, you know, and it just ain't going to be looking good for me as far as the numbers. So, you know. I mean, straight up, literally, within like two months, me and M.W. Smith, cool as holy hell. I wish he lived closer for all of the deep conversations we'd be, we be building, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, that's just not the reality anywhere in my vicinity. I got one homeboy, and he works offshore, so I only see him once a month. Talk about deprived. <laughs> I'm alone. Second wave is going to hit in the first three weeks. And then... I think the second wave, because the woman that he keeps mentioning, I actually have her video cued, but we don't have to watch that now, because I didn't know he was going to go through this. My main point was showing the woman's video, because I had saw that one. Um, but this one had black people in the title, so I, had to, I wanted to see his opinion. The second wave, I believe, are those who have the insolence and this, that, and the other, you know what I'm saying, like the people, you know, with the medications, and... This is my opinion. I don't think I've heard anybody say this. Um, the second wave of death, I think it's going to be the people bugging in. The people thinking that they're going to line the walls of their house and keep out the hordes. With a D, not, a, not whores, not like prostitution or nothing. But the hordes of the masses, you know, that's a better word, the masses. Um, you know, when people get hungry, you know, that might as well be the walking dead. I think that's the reason they're showing us all this zombie junk anyway. Ain't nobody going to turn zombie. Those zombies are hungry, desperate people. And you walk amongst them every day. They just not in go mode yet. You know what I'm saying? So I think that second wave is people who got the food in their house. Either they done ran out of food or somebody done found out that they got food and they coming for it. Or the people with their simple medications who can't get to a doctor anymore. You know? Um personal story um <laughs> mw you know what i'm talking about because i told him the first thing i found out and i walked in the house day before yesterday off of my long ass day of work my damn ac didn't broke man the eight the air conditioning just had shot down i walked in the house and when i walked onto the porch i could feel the heat coming from inside and when i opened the door you would have thought the devil blew a breath straight in my face chewing cinnamon bubble gum if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but I walked to the thermostat, it's 106 degrees in my house. And, and when I left for work at 5 o'clock in the morning, the AC was blowing fine, you know, cool air. I get home around 3, 4, 106 degrees. You think you stand in your house without power? So I think the second wave is also going to include heat stroke. I live in the south. Other people gonna freeze to death. It varies. Finally, the third wave will hit in the next three months. <clears throat> I don't have no answer for the third wave, but since the fact that he going through waves, he had to end his video. Um, let's see how I actually had this set up. Since he pretty much brought up that woman, 
who is oh snap I mean click introducing on. cool vantage jeans from Wrangler Riggs workwear hard working jeans for the toughest jobs cool I hope they survived the desert anyway <clears throat> Folks, That's the woman he's talking about. We're not going to go through the video. Her deep. Just learned an interesting lesson about my camera. It's not my uploading skills. It's my camera, regardless if it's still going, it only records in 30 minute segments. So I don't even know what to say. So, anyway, I'm going to redo this part that came right after the last part. This is a solar shower camp bag. This is a five gallon solar camp shower bag. The idea is to fill it up with water, whether it be a lake, a tap, rain barrel, and let it sit in the sun for a little bit. Let it warm up and hang it. And use this shower head. Very high tech. I've tried it once before. It is not. Before, but I've never put on video. <laughs> it's not very high tech. But in my mind, transporting water in any way, shape, or form, that bag is good for, as well as bathing. If you don't trust the water, whether it be from stream, river, lake, ditch even, I don't know. If you don't trust it in your eyes or mouth, protect your eyes and mouth while bathing. But as you see, it's in a very jet black to absorb sunlight and heat. Therefore, you ain't got to take only cold showers. Very useful, I believe. Fills up very nice and thick. And in the demonstration, which is limited because we ain't trying to show no nudity. No nudity. So this is going to take some working, and for obvious reasons, I won't be filming me showering with it. So I'll give you a review afterward. Here's what I can show you about the shower that's not X-rated, and that's the flow rate of the nozzle once I get it open here. That's pretty good. I'm impressed. A little bit chilly. That's about as risky as I'm going to get here. Like I said, I'll give you a review after I've actually showered with it. But as you see, he has it in an elevated position. You know, let gravity do its thing as far as the water. Um, I see here in my side screen, and I'm not going to take the time to actually look at it on camera, I might in my spare time, and if you want to, there's a few hacks, like, you know, building your own little shower or whatever, and that, if you see from this one, the mechanics shouldn't be that complicated, you know, you know, it's gravity, you know, pretty much, but, um, you know, whether there's a tree around, a rock ledge that you can balance the bag on, or whether you got to dig a hole in the ground, put in your own log and create a post. You can get your hygiene on, you know. You can also transport five gallons worth of water, which can be useful. Um, there was one more. One more. Video. Damn. <clears throat> I believe that if life gives you lemons, you should make lemonade. And try to find somebody whose life has given them vodka and have a party. Ron White. Here are 25 home uses for cheap vodka. Besides drinking. 6. Eases aches and pains. Add fresh lavender flowers and vodka into a glass jar and put it out in the sun for three days, longer if you live in a cloudy place, to extract the oils and goodness. Strain the mixture and rub it onto any aches or pains you have. Five, soothes a toothache. To ease a toothache, swirl a shot of vodka around your mouth, especially around the painful area, to disinfect it and numb some of the pain. Four, makes DIY extracts. Store-bought extracts are pretty pricey. Take more control over your cooking and wallet by making your own at home. Take whatever item you're looking to extract the essence from, oranges or mint for example, and seal them in a mason jar with vodka for a week or more. 3. Treat dandruff. Alright, and just because my video cut off, 
I think we just to make sure I have this or just to make sure y'all have this I guess is the best way to put it there we go Shoot, it might be better the second time around because everything ain't go right the first time I showed it I just want a short video though I ain't trying to take all day on this See what's happening with this. This is what buying food looks like in Venezuela. Waiting for hours, hoping that by the time one hands in their allotted number, there'll still be food left. And this is what it feels like. This is a great sadness because I didn't know this Venezuela several years ago. Afro brother! Something new, something unbelievable, unacceptable. It has no other name but catastrophic. Economists say a decade of price controls crippled the productive sector and gave rise to a black market. Shelves are now empty. These hour-long queues have become emblematic of Venezuela's economic crisis. People in this line have said they've been queuing not only for hours but for years now. They're getting simply desperate. For the government, shortages are part of an economic war waged by capitalist forces. Its latest plan is to battle it with claps or a new food distribution system. We are going toward a revolution of the food distribution systems, which is where we've been penetrated by the parasitic capitalists, by the smugglers, the speculators, the criminals. In the 23 de Enero community, a bastion of government support in the capital Caracas, the new system has shortened the wait. Flour, milk, Margarine, bean and rice, sold for... Now, this is a light video compared to the one I showed you a second ago. Today is June 19, 2016. This is another video on the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. Used to looking for scraps of food in the gutter and by the side of the road, such as this woman pictured in Caracas, as police look on. Ah, don't show Food me is that. now so scarce, even the dogs are starving. And then we have this exact same location again, where they're sorting the lettuce. And then we have the Hunger Games style parties where the elite dine and they enjoy their decadence. Are they enjoying themselves? It's not that we don't care about the poor people. We give a lot to charity, one golfer told Mail Online. Should we stop enjoying ourselves just because the country is burning? Are you your brother's keeper? Guests at the Caracas Club feast on steak tartare and sashimi while the country is so damaged that its officials were want. A member of the government militia center stands with his gun clearly on display in an attempt to maintain order. Now, again, I am not advocating anything, but like I said, well, like I meant to say, I really don't know exactly where my video cut off at, but there's a section of people that are in the quote unquote, not going to survive category and we're in it. The people who want to go natural again. The people who want to leave the societal system. And within that category, the stereotype is those groups of people, the naturalists, the holistic, you can go on, you know, in your definitions, um, they are thought not to be prepared for any sense of conflict, any sense of strife. And He the only one with a gun in that mass of people not advocating any violence but those people are starving and he's standing in the middle of them with an AR-15 I'm just saying that's our future <laughs> well I don't know who our is I don't know who we is I don't know what you plan on staying for but how your boy brought up parkour in the other video I wouldn't plan on staying within any inner city but 
just not to waste y'all time, look into the economic collapse of Venezuela. You know, it's seriously going down. Um, last week, I saw a news report where they had broken, you know, citizens had broke into a, um, a zoo, the public zoo. And, you know, they slaughtered, you know, some of the animals that, you know, some of the zoo animals, I can't think of which specific ones or whatever, you know what I'm saying? If they were eating elephant or if they were eating horse, I don't know. But, you know, they broke into the local zoo and slaughtered the animals for meat. You know, what does the shelf life look like in your city? I mean, how many days is that food going to be on the shelf for everybody to stand in a long line waiting for their allotted number to be called so they can make whatever grocery they are allowed? I mean, what if it gets down to only one bag of sugar per house per whole per month or some shit like that? I mean, you get the scenarios. Let me turn this camera around. Crooked. Anyway, um, back to the video before the Venezuela video, which was the uses for alcohol. I'm not advocating any drinking, but you know I don't I don't drink. I, you know I got a weak stomach, but. Distilling, distilling, or extracting natural ele elements from their key sources like plants and mint leaves and so on and so forth. You know, we're gonna read this. I just been caught up. We're gonna read this. Um, within there, I mean, you get into the medicines and what's useful for healing and this, that, and the other. And to have something to extract the useful elements, I believe, is a useful, you know, sense of knowledge, you know, or a useful avenue of knowledge because it to make your own medicine, you know, in a sense, you know, I mean, I had a much better dialogue about this, but, you know, I had to go through that like three minutes of, oh, snap this shit and erased half of my video. <laughs> it's literally my second time doing the second portion, like when the camera clicks or whatever the hell. But even within here, you know, when got me some alcohol, you know, not rubbing alcohol, drinking alcohol, you know, don't be, you know, use your mind. I got mint leaves, honey, a few cough drops, um, a pain pill prescribed. I, have, I had a neck issue like two years ago um, there's something else in here oh I had a family member caught a, a bad sense of the flu or borderline pneumonia so there was something prescribed to him and there's a little bit of it in there and no lie when you crack that bad boy open I've had it sitting in the window sill like maybe for like a month now and it's, it's heatable you can set it on the stove it's tin you know and you open that bad boy, it smell like children's Tylenol. If any of y'all from the 90s and y'all remember that, that pink stuff, you know what I'm saying, that children's Tylenol, it smelled just like that. I, I wasn't feeling good one day or whatever, so just in personal experimentation, I sacrificed my body. Um, <laughs> took a swig of that, brother didn't die. You know what I'm saying? Y'all remember the movies with the old witch doctors or the shaman or whatever this, that, and the other? Normally invol involves a white man of some sort who's new to the village. That white man gets sick. They start grinding up that shit in that bowl. <laughs> and man go to spitting that stuff. You know, you always spitting that stuff, you know. Like, oh, I'm going to heal you. <laughs> I don't think I want you to heal me. That shit is nasty. But, you know, you take a swig of that, swig of that junk. And he tell you to lay down in the bed and sweat that shit out, you know. When I was younger, you know, my pops, who was a pretty country man, you know. Um... I had a flu real bad once or whatever. He took a little small, you know, a little small glass of whiskey, you know, nothing dangerous for a child, which I was like 12, 13 at the time. Um, took a little small glass of whiskey, put that junk in the microwave pretty hot, brought it back to me and told me to drink it pretty fast and lay down. 
That's why I went to sweating. That flew past. You know what I'm saying? Holla at me. You can have a swig. <laughs> but I encourage you to make your own. You know what I'm saying? NyQuil ain't going to be on the shelf. And that's just the example I had in my mind. I'm pretty sure some, you know, somebody out there is a nurse. And they probably gonna tell me, oh, be careful, da da da, kiss my ass. You know what I'm saying? I feel you, but we gotta go back. You know, it's gotta be natural again. You know, there's got there's gonna be risk. You know, brother is gonna be drinking rainwater one day. Oh, the pH level, kiss my ass. I'm trying to live. I'm gonna check it the best I can, boil it, do what I gotta do, or whatever. You know, and the rest is on high. You know what I'm saying? Am I supposed to live or I'm supposed to die? We all got some choices to make. We all got thinking to do. I'm not trying to kill anybody's mood. I hope everybody's doing just fine. Off the sky. Y'all take care.